the next up is uh, Renaud Susi de la Roche, uh, Susi la Roche, sorry. He's going to be talking about uh, monazite, xenotime, and the luminosilicate polymorphs. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello. I'll uh, show you a neat example from the Canadian Cordillera to demonstrate how monazite, xenotime, and the luminosilicate polymorphs can form a fantastic combination to decipher the polymetamorphic evolution of metamorphic domains. The Canadian Cordillera comprises Paleozoic to Cenozoic terrains that experienced a complex magmatic, tectonic, and metamorphic history related to the formation of the Western Laurentian margin. The Yukon Tanana terrain, shown in turquoise on the map, is the focus of this presentation. This terrain rifted from the Laurentian margin in the late Devonian and underwent several tectonal metamorphic and magmatic cycles prior to returning to its current location. The basement of the terrain is composed of late Devonian and older siliciclastic rocks of the snow cap assemblage and is overlain by Paleozoic to Mesozoic magmatic rocks. The Yukon Tanana terrain records several episodes of metamorphism all over the pressure temperature space and spanning approximately 250 million years. These metamorphic episodes have been used to support often contradictory tectonic models. They include a first episode of high pressure metamorphism associated with, with the subduction during the early Mississippian, a second episode of exogite and green schist to lower amphibolite facies metamorphism during the middle to late Permian is attributed to subduction and collision of the Yukon Tanana terrain with either Laurentia or Nintra Oceanic ice. Pyroxene Hornfell's facies. Metamorphism during the Middle Triassic may be related to magmatism due to subduction beneath the Yukon Tanana terrain or be the result of extensional tectonics. The early Jurassic involves a widespread upper amphibolite facious fan associated with a collision, but it's not clear if the Yukon Tanana terrain collided with, both, with the adjacent, adjacent Stikin terrain, the Laurentian margin, or both. Finally, low pressure contact metamorphism during the middle Jurassic to early Cretaceous locally overprinted previous metamorphic episodes. As you can see, several metamorphic events are susceptible to have affected rocks of the Yukon Tanana terrain. I will now transport you to the beautiful Aethlian area of Northwestern British Columbia to look into this polymetamorphic evolution. So I think everyone here loves field pictures. So here they are. There, the Yukon Tanana terrain is represented by the Florence Range suite in purple on the map, which is a metamorphosed continental margin sedimentary sequence correlated to the snow cap assemblage basement of the terrain. It should therefore record much of the tectonic evolution. The complexity of the mineral assemblages points to a polymetamorphic evolution suitable to characterize multiple events. We investigated eight samples with in situ laser ablation split stream petrochronology on monazide and xenotime. Monazide is a well known and widely used petrochronometer, but xenotime doesn't receive as much attention. However, I'll show you that xenotime can provide timing constraints that wouldn't be available based on monazide data alone. When I mentioned the complex mineral assemblages, that's what I was talking about. Aluminosilicate polymorphs are common, and we can find kyanite, sulaminite, and, and luzite in the same area, in the same sample, and even in the same microscopic field of view. This observation is particularly important because these minerals crystallize at distinct pressure temperature conditions. So knowing when they crystallize provides useful first order constraints on the pressure temperature time path. Two crystallization sequences have been interpreted by previous workers from petrographic observations alone, but it's not always easy to recognize undoubtedly which mineral crystallized first. Here, for example, analuzide seems to overgrow kyanite, which is inconsistent with the analuzide to silimonite to kyanite crystallization sequence. Adding absolute time constraints is therefore necessary to confirm the sequence, but also to link each aluminosilicate polymorph to the appropriate metamorphic event at the scale of the origin. Luckily, there is plenty of monazite and xenotime in these rocks. Other index minerals, such as sterolite, k-feldspar, and cordierite, 
are not shown in this photograph, but also help to a lesser extent to reconstruct their PTT path. We have analyzed dozens of monocyte and xenotime grains for a total of over 650 meaningful dates. As you can see, there is a major concentration of early Jurassic dates, but we also measure dates in the Permian, Triassic, and early Cretaceous. The trace element composition and textural context are critical to interpret them, so I will walk you through each of these peaks with data from a representative sample of each of them. The oldest dates we were measured on the monocyte inclusions in the cores of large garnet porphyroblasts from one of our samples. Garnet composition in this sample indicates multiple generations of growth and cores contain inclusions of sterolite and kyanite. These dates document the first episode of Barovian metamorphism that reached the kyanite stability field between 270 and 245 MA. Classic dates in the same sample all come from one monocyte inclusion at the edge of absorbed garnet. It intersects a crack and has a much higher atrium, indicative of growth after garnet resorption, because garnet is a natrium sink that can release this element during breakdown. These dates provide potential evidence for retrograde metamorphism between 245 and 228. Earliest Jurassic monocyte is commonly included in the rim of garnet and is characterized by low atrium, consistent with syngarnet growth. These analyses point to a second episode of prograde metamorphism between 195 and 185 MA, but unfortunately, the PT conditions are not constrained. Monocyte in most samples displays an increase in yttrium at 185 May, indicative of growth after the breakdown of an yttrium sink, such as garnet. Xenotime could also be a culprit in theory, but I'll show you in the next slide why this is unlikely. These monocyte grains are commonly intergrown with sulimonite, indicating that the rocks were in the sulimonite stable field at that time. Xenotime starts to crystallize at 185 MA, near partially to completely resorbed garnet. For example, the uh, yellow spots here uh, represent the location of xenotime grains around its sodomorph garnet. The co-crystallization of xenotime and monazite between 185 and 170 MA indicates that the increase in yttrium and monazite cannot be attributed to xenotime breakdown, but must result from the breakdown of garnet. The observed textures are likely the result of decompression of the rocks to the sulimonite plus k feldspar stability field and or cooling within that field. There are a few monocyte dates younger than 170 MA, and they all come from inclusions in andalusite and cordierite, which are indicative of low pressure metamorphism. However, xenotime is best to date this last metamorphic event. Indeed, we measured many xenotime dates as young as 120 MA. Therefore, n luzite and cordierite must be younger than that. In some samples, garnet is partially replaced by these two minerals. n luzite formed in the outer corona, whereas cordierite formed in the inner corona, indicating that n luzite crystallized first. When we put all these data together, we can reconstruct a pressure temperature time path with three distinct loops. The first loop in black occurred during the Permian and reached at least the kyanite stability field, tentatively followed by retrograde metamorphism during the Triassic. A second episode of garnet growth and prograde metamorphism in green occurred during uh, the earliest Jurassic, but the PT path may have been above or below the kyanite sulimonite transition. There's no evidence for stable sulimonite during garnet growth, favoring the higher pressure path, but the lower pressure path cannot be ruled out completely. The late early Jurassic is marked by decompression and or cooling in the sulimonite and K-Felspar field in blue, followed by further cooling in orange. The last episode of metamorphism in red is characterized by low pressure metamorphism in the andalusite and cordierite stability fields during or after the late early Cretaceous. 
Now let's go back to the scale of the Canadian Cordillera and compare these data to the evolution of the Yukon Canada terrain. There is uh, no evidence for early Mississippian metamorphism in the Athlin area, so I cannot talk about this event. The Permian metamorphic uh, event remains cryptic, but the minimum pressure implied by the presence of kyanite is higher than documented at that time elsewhere in the Yukon Tanana terrain, except for the Eclogites, but these rocks imply a completely different tectonic setting. Although we don't quite understand the Permian Triassic tectonic setting, available data suggests that the uh, metamorphic grade and facies series varied across the Yukon Tanana terrain which suggests that this terrain should not be viewed as a homogeneous entity until the late Triassic, at least from a tectonic metamorphic perspective. Early Jurassic metamorphism is widespread in the Yukon Tanana terrain, and the Atlan area is no exception. Our new data points to a Barovian metamorphic event compatible with a major contractional event, but additional constraints from the adjacent to King terrain are still needed to assess its role in the collision. Finally, the early Cretaceous low pressure event we documented most likely results from contact metamorphism near plutons of the Coast Belt magnetic suite, which are common in the Athlan area and everywhere in the western part of the Yukon Tanana terrain. In conclusion, uh, petrochronometers must be analyzed in situ in their preserved metamorphic context, while aluminosilicate polymorphs provide reliable first order PD constraints in polymetamorphic rocks. Xenotime is an underrated petrochronometer that can complement monazite data and should be used more, if possible, of course. The Florence Range rocks of the Athlan area preserve evidence for two contractional events overprinted by contact metamorphism. At the origin scale, the Jurassic and younger evolution of the Yukon Tanana terrain is relatively homogeneous, but the Permian evolution still hides a lot of complexity. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for, for a great talk. Uh, we've already got uh, some questions coming in and we've got a couple of minutes. Uh, so Richard Palin asks um, questions about the uh, the rare earth use of rare earth signatures for petrochronology, basically, uh, because the length scale of equilibration for rare earths is much smaller than for major elements at the temperatures you're considering. Uh, how sure you that the differences in rare earth contents are not recording local heter heterogeneity rather than rock scale changes? Um, if you were <laughs> got the gist of the question. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, <laughs> I was trying to. Uh read it in the chat, well, find the chat at the same time. Uh, well, it is possible that they, they record smaller change than, uh, well, uh, well, smaller heterogeneity at, the, at a small scale. However, uh, in these rugged monocytes, it's really, well, it's really close to, to Garnet, for example, and in Garnet, there are clear resorption, resorption textures, so it's uh, well. It's it's fairly uh, fairly evident that the garnet resorption could release those elements in the system, and we we don't have to look for another more complex uh, uh, interpretation of those uh, trace element patterns. Just like the uh, the xenotime crystals that are concentrated at the rims of resorbed garnet, as soon as garnet is starting to uh, to resorb xenotime, has the atrium available to crystallize and. Uh, you appear exactly at that location. Okay, we'll have we'll have one more question. Hopefully, a quick answer. Uh, Adrian Castro asks: um, uh, It's previously been shown that kyanite can grow contemporaneously with storolite, uh, with only modest overstepping of the storolite in reaction. How do you think this might affect the interpretation of your PT paths? Uh, Storolite is only present as inclusion in the core of the garnet that record, the, well, that include those Permian uh, monocyte. For that event, I can say that it reached kyanite stability field. I'm not going to say that it reached over uh, storolite stability field or both or whatever. Uh, we need to remember that there are two other metamorphic events that overprint these rocks. So knowing the uh, chemical composition of the system during Permian metamorphism to have meaningful uh, uh, 
meaningful thermodynamic model that results is incredibly difficult. There are many processes that need to, to be uh, taken into account. So I think the best we can see for now is kyanite grade at least. And because kyanite is, uh, has a stability field that is really well constrained and independent on the geochemical composition, then it's uh, not super precise, but at least it's reliable.